These are the paintings that most of us will say, well, I can do this too. But these are the works of art that people were said to have a religious experience when they're in front of them, often moved to tears or overwhelmed by the ineffable mysteries of these paintings. And the man behind it, he's hailed as this century's most wept over artist. His works were sold for millions. One of his exhibitions was where Hillary and Bill Clinton had their first date. Mark Rothko exhibit. And I said, oh, I didn't, I, I, I missed that. I, I wish I'd seen it. So Bill said, why, you really like Rothko? I said, yeah, I really, I really like him. He introduces me to this gentleman. He goes, this is, you know, John the janitor. And John the janitor said, he'll let us in if we pick up all the trash on the lawn. Oh my I God, said, what an operator so this guy is. So we pick up the trash, yeah. and then we get to go in and see the Rothkos. But I know what you're thinking. These are just blocks of colors, rectangles within a bigger rectangle. How are these even worth studying? But his paintings weren't always like this. They could be understood against a much more complicated historical backdrop in mid-20th century America. Here's Mark Rothko. That if the viewer properly experienced his paintings, that he or she would very often cry. It's difficult to stand in front of a work by Mark Rothko and not be completely transfixed by the way that the, the brushwork and the surface moves and how, how the different fields of color interact and sort of vibrate in front of you. Born in the former Russian Empire, now Latvia, Marcus Rothkowitz was raised by his atheist, Marxist father who was a pharmacist and an intellectual. Despite his modest upbringing, he was a voracious reader and was highly educated. Around the time when he was 10, he moved to Portland, Oregon, when he finished his high school and then got a scholarship to study at Yale, but dropped out the next year when his scholarship was not renewed. He moved to New York, studied under Max Weber, a Cubist artist. This is where he learned his modernism and the avant-garde movement in Europe. But what exactly do these buzzwords mean anyway? Modernism, postmodernism. To put it very, very simply, modernism is defined by is experimentation on forms. If a thing is a form plus matter, just like a brick is a red rectangular box with clay, forms are the qualities of this thing. The colors, the shapes, the texture, the qualities of this thing we see in front of us. And the matter is the lump of clay, the material. So modernist art experiments with forms to call attention to itself in a bizarre or unpredictable way that makes us uncomfortable. Like Fauvism plays with unrealistic colors, and Cubism with words from Picasso plays on the different perspectives that you can draw an object from different points of view. So modernism is a rejection of traditional art practices or social realism, and postmodernism is a rejection of modernism. It is about tearing down structures and grand narratives of their predecessors. If modernism is art, then postmodernism is anti-art art, like calling uh, a urinal art, or calling Campbell soup art, or calling an unknown trans woman or unknown drag queen a superstar. But Rothko's work would be considered as part of the former movement, modernism. In his early career, his paintings in the 1930s is still quite realistic. You can still tell it's a subway station or some children in the streets. But then he met Milton Avery, a modernist painter who experimented on simplified forms and glowing colors. There's no illusion of depth in his paintings. He's very unconventional for his time, but still too representational and too realistic for the movements that Rothko was going to lead the charge. In the late 30s, the growing anti-Semitism in Europe and in America during World War II made Rothko change his name from Marcus Rothkowitz to Mark Rothko. The war changed him and changed his work. He drew inspiration from Nietzsche and Greek tragedies, using monsters and mythologies to fill this spiritual void in humanity. This sense of immediacy can be seen from his essay the romantics were prompted. Without monsters and gods, art cannot enact our drama. 
art's most profound moments expressed this frustration. When they were abandoned as untenable superstitions, art sank into melancholy. It became fond of the dark and enveloped its objects in the nostalgic intimations of a half-lit world. This led to his path to creating works that are transcendental to this half-lit world. His subjects were no longer pedestrians or grey, lifeless urban landscapes, but were surrealistic, mythical creatures. Rothko used imageries from Sophocles' tragedies like Oedipus Rex and Antigone, or something more Judeo-Christian like Gethsemane, the garden where Jesus was betrayed by Judas and arrested before his crucifixion. Tragedies in Nietzsche's eyes redeem man from the terrors of mortality, but Rothko used tragedies to redeem the modern man from the spiritual emptiness in the face of mortality. It was then the social realism in American art has evolved into a more surrealistic, more abstract form of art. Rothko met Clifford Steele, whose abstract paintings influenced his later works. Slow Swear at the Edge of the Sea is the turning point which showcased Rothko's newfound style in abstraction after he met his second wife, Mal. So abstract that the figures were further abstracted into just shapes and colors and the titles of the paintings were either numbers or nothing at all. They are known as the multiform paintings now. Rothko got rid of the myth, the human figures, the landscapes, the symbols, and just simply put these self-contained units of human expression on the canvas. These blurred blocks of colors, which are contrasting but also complementary to express the same, if not more, emotional intensity. Hence the term of the movement, abstract expressionism. Rothko was a very serious painter. The painting process was so laborious that during his later years, he would hire assistants to work on it. Quick brushes and layer after layer of thin paint, one on top of the other, to create this dense mixture of colors. And because Rothko layered color over color over color, any given zone is infinitely complex. He will also mix it with natural materials like animal glue and eggs to make the paint dry more quickly when applying layers of colors. But this also makes the pigments fade when the paintings are exposed to light. And he never varnished his paintings. That's why the Harvard murals deteriorated so quickly that now they will have to use projectors to compensate for the loss of colors. Rothko recommended his viewers to stand as close as 18 inches away from his paintings to feel enveloped by his work. When asked to create murals for a fancy restaurant in the Seagram building, he would intentionally create these large-scale murals to, in his words, ruin the appetite of every son of a bitch who ever eats in that room. The spirituality of his work was exemplified in his meditative space commissioned by the Dominials to create what's known as the Rothko Chapel today. Shortly after Rothko arrived in the United States, his father died of cancer, which made him sever his ties with all kinds of religions. But he's always fascinated with the transcendental experience of viewing a piece of religious art. That's why in this Rothko chapel, he put up this monochromatic triptychs that echo the Roman Catholic art, even though the chapel itself is non-denominational. These paintings, dark, impenetrable surfaces, allow the viewers to see beyond the blocks of colors and to experience the solitude that we all feel but seldom eloquently express. In one of the last few lines of his essay, Rothko put this feeling into words. But the solitary figure could not raise its limbs in a single gesture that might indicate its concern with the fact of mortality and an insatiable appetite for ubiquitous experience in face of this fact. Nor could this solitude be overcome. It could gather on beaches and streets and in parks only through coincidence and with its companions form a tableau vivant of human incommunicability. 
Rothko killed himself at the age of 66 because of his declining health and crippling depression. His feeling of solitude is more dramatic than any monster or any god in the face of our inevitable mortality. Thank you.